For RCR Wireless News, my name is Sean Kinney and I'm here with Durga Malati, who's Qualcomm's SVP of Engineering and Research and Development. So Durga, a lot of exciting news coming out of Qualcomm ahead of Mobile World Congress. But before we get into that, I was hoping maybe you could take a look back at the development of the 5G and R standard that we saw in 2017 and then a look ahead at what we expect throughout the remainder of 2018. Sure. So last year around this time frame, we had set upon a few goals for ourselves and one of that was uh, the successful completion of the first phase of the 5G and R standards based upon what is known as the non-standalone mode, wherein we use 5G and R uh, as an added uh, radio in addition to a 4G anchor. And about one year back when we started this, we wanted to make sure that things are done in the right way in the standards process, while at the same time, we wanted to work with the rest of the ecosystem uh, in terms of uh, spec compliant implementations and interoperable tests and so on. So at this point in time, uh, in December of last year, we had a pretty big milestone uh, with the entire industry when the specifications were completed in a timely manner. And now we are on to what is known as a standalone mode of the standardization process. That's going to complete sometime this year. But I think the nice thing is that along with this, as we were working with a lot of our infrastructure partners, we had a series of milestones which started off in November last year with ZT, December of last year with Ericsson, and then as of today with Nokia, where we worked with them on sub six gigahertz and millimeter wave spec compliant implementation. So there's nothing proprietary here. It's a completely interoperable spec that we are working with. And it also gives a sense of reassurance to the ecosystem that the specs were indeed completed in the right manner. And that's the reason why we have these significant milestones with all these vendors. But as I said, there were three steps. Step one was to make sure that the specs were completed. Step two was to make sure that we had uh, the right kind of interoperable tests with infra vendors along with field trials. And step three would be the commercial deployments. We are well underway with step two right now and we look forward towards the 2019 commercial deployments. So when we see these early commercial deployments in the 2019 timeframe, uh, I think the target use case is going to be enhanced mobile broadband Correct. for the consumer. But 5G is a lot, about a lot more than enhanced mobile broadband. I know your group is doing some real interesting forward-looking work on how 5G spectrum sharing is going to develop, how it applies to the industrial IoT, and uh, particularly how it applies to the automotive industry. Can That's you correct. tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So uh, you're absolutely right. We had a pretty big ambition as far as the use cases of 5G that go way beyond mobile broadband. And in fact, you know, when we set upon something like that for ourselves, wherein we are interested in transforming industries with it, we specifically looked at like a few use cases that were very important for us. Uh, the first one, I'm going to spend some time on industrial IoT. We spent a lot of time with a lot of our partners in the industries. Quite a few of them are kind of new to cellular, so there's a lot of uh, uh, teaching uh, from our perspective as to what 5G is capable of, and in return getting requirements from them as to what this is what we would like to see in 5G. As a part of that exercise, what usually when you think of manufacturing today, uh, a manufacturing plant is a highly cluttered environment, very dynamic, things are moving all over the place. But it's also an environment where people are interested in uh, looking at new ways of uh, automation in a manufacturing plant. And one of the key attributes for that would be the replacement of wireline with wireless. But at the same time, we want the same quality of service as a wireline, which means it needs to be very reliable and the latency has to be very small. And we call that as ultra-reliable low latency communications. This is going to be, we've been working on this from a research standpoint, but it's going to be standardized as a part of release 16, the second phase of 5G. But at the same time, we are working with those industries and we have uh, some key demonstrations which indicate what happens when you actually do replace a wire with wireless. Do you still get the same kind of a quality of service with that ultra reliable low latency communication? And the answer is yes, you do. And another part that we are looking at is spectrum sharing. Now, we took a big step ahead uh, a few years back when we took LTE into unlicensed spectrum, which manifested itself as LAA in the commercial domain. So LAA is commercial today in the US and several cities. It's going very well. So the question then we asked ourselves is, if we were to do this with 5G, what would be new? And what is the new frontier as far as unlicensed and spectrum sharing is concerned? And we hit upon some key concepts which we think bring a lot more to the table in unlicensed spectrum, way beyond where we left off LAA and multifire with. And one of that is the increasing usage of spatial techniques. Today in 5G, we use a larger number of antennas 
predominantly in the base station but also in the device. And the next question to ask ourselves is, can we do the same thing in unlicensed and if we were to do that, what would happen? So the spatial domain spectrum sharing techniques are quite new, very promising, and we have a test bed that indicates what sort of capacity gains and user experience gains we would get with that. That's another facet that we are kind of very excited about. So Durga, Qualcomm has done a lot of pioneering work around cellular V2X communications. Can you help me understand what the role of 5G is in supporting vehicular connectivity? So that's a very important question. So you are absolutely right. We spent a lot of time on cellular V2X trying to understand where exactly is the role of a radio in automotive uh, industry in general, apart from just connectivity to the network. In release 14 of LTE, we came out with a unique design which relied upon vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle communications for basic safety. Vehicles communicating with each other so we can avoid collisions and introduce a new element of safety in the whole process. But as we started looking at 5G, we thought a little bit more than that and we said, okay, if you were to take an autonomous vehicle, does radio have any role to play at all? After all, there are autonomous vehicles today which, have, um, which rely upon cameras and sensors and do a pretty good job. And we started looking at, if we did have a radio, what does that bring to the table? It's interesting to see that as we think about all autonomous vehicles having some sort of a radio in them, they can actually communicate with each other a little more than what you could do with just visual line of sight. So for instance, they can share their intent, as in one vehicle could tell all the other vehicles in its vicinity that this is what it is going to do in the next few milliseconds. This sort of an intent sharing can help in advanced path planning in autonomous driving. So if you were to picture a world where every vehicle is autonomous and that would be one way of looking at it. So we think that 5G based radio when you bring in ultra reliable low latency communication with high bandwidth, uh, it actually complements the role of cameras and sensors and that would be like a complete solution for autonomous driving. That's the way that we perceive it. Well, you know, I really look forward to, to hearing from you again as 5G goes from transforming the mobile industry to transforming all industries. So thank you very much for your time, Durga. Thank you.